comes to Genesis chapter 25, if you will, this morning. I want to minister on the subject of staying in peace. <coughs> staying in peace. And uh, I think that, I, I believe that I have a word from heaven to you today. And uh, if the Lord will help me to minister it the way he helped me to see it, I think that you'll be helped. Genesis chapter 25. And I want to start reading with verse 21. And Isaac prayed to the Lord on behalf of his wife because she was barren. And the Lord answered him, and Rebekah, his wife, conceived. But the children struggled together within her, and she said, If this is so, or in other words, if it's of the Lord, why am I this way? And these two babies were literally fighting, warring within her body. So she went to inquire of the Lord. And the Lord said to her, Two nations are in your womb. Two peoples shall be separate from your body. Now, let me just say this. Uh, she would, the Lord was not saying that two nations as in, uh, you, know, no, uh, you know, one's going to be uh, African and the other one's going to be uh, Arab. That's not what he meant. What he meant is he meant two different, spiritually different people are in your womb. There's two different kinds of people in your womb. And the Bible says, and the two shall be separated from your body. The word separated there actually means that there will have to be. In order for one to survive, there would have to be a separation of the two of them. We're going to get into all this this, uh, this morning. And the one people shall be stronger than the other, but the older will serve the younger. And when her days were to be delivered, were fulfilled, behold, there was twins in her womb. And now the first came out forth red and all over like a hairy garment. And they named him Esau. And afterward, his brother came forth with his hand holding to Esau's heel. And so his name was called Jacob. And Isaac was 60 years old when she gave birth to them. Now this is what I really want to get to, verse 27. And when the boys grew up, Esau became a skillful hunter, a man of the field. We'll get to that. But Jacob was a peaceful man living in the house. Father, we just come before you this morning. We ask for your grace, your anointing, and your help. As we minister your word today, we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen. When I'm talking about staying in peace, uh, I'm reading the New American Standard. I have been reading the New American Standard, I don't know, for three or four years now. I grew up on the King James. And uh, I don't know what your King James translates that verse as, but the New American Standard says that Jacob was a, a man of peace dwelling in the house. The, word, the wording where it says that Esau was a man of the field uh, it actually implies that he was a restless man. Esau could never stay home. He always had to have something going on because there was a restlessness in his spirit. There was a lack of peace in Esau's spirit. And man, how, how we're seeing that today. We're seeing that people can't stay put. Uh, people can't even, people don't want quiet. There's people that have to have a TV on, even to sleep. Because there's so much turmoil in their mind and in their spirit. These things are not new. These things have been going on in the human family since the fall. And, and, and when the Lord talked to uh, Rebecca, she said, two men are a people. Esau is a type. He's a type of the flesh. He is stronger than Jacob. He, in the natural, your flesh is stronger than you. What do I mean by the flesh? I mean, there's that thing, there's that one place in you that is stronger than you. That no matter how determined you've ever been, I'm talking to believers now, no matter how, long, how, how determined you've ever been, it's always overpowered you. No matter how consecrated or dedicated you've ever tried to be, there's an Esau in your life. Let me just say what an Esau is. An Esau is something, there's people in this house that there's an emotion or there's a spiritual battle you were born with it as far back as you can remember remembering. Esau was a womb battle. Came out of the womb. Jacob came out of the womb warring with Esau. There's people in this house, and maybe this is true at some level of all of humanity, that every human being, because of the fall and because of the sin nature, that every human being has one place in their life that has been stronger than them. I'm not talking necessarily about uh, and as, a, as a sinner, and maybe even as a Christian, it does lead you to sin. It may lead you to some kind of an addiction, but the addiction is not really your problem. The problem is the emotion behind it. It's this thing that quakes in your spirit. 
It's this thing that's undone in you. It's this thing that cannot be calmed in you. Let me just say something about Esau. Esau gave birth to the nation of Edom. It says in the days of David that David put garrisons only in certain countries. Countries that could never be trusted. Countries where quarrels never stopped breaking out. Countries where there was always uh, uh, something in them that wanted to rise up and cast off David. And David put garrisons in Edom. What am I trying to say? I'm trying to say that Esau is uncomparable to you. You can't, you're never going to outgrow it. You're never going to outrun it. I don't care how old you'll ever be. I don't care how smart you're ever going to get. There's something within every human heart. How do I know that? I know that because even Paul had a place. Yeah. Yeah. And, that, and that was that, what that's meant to do is to drive you to understand the power of resting in Christ. Yeah. The Bible says that, he, that Jacob was a man of peace. It means as long as he stayed in the house, as long as he stayed in peace, Esau was brought to his feet. It's interesting, as long as Jacob stayed in peace, this, this thing that was more powerful, that if he tried to stand up and contend with it, if he ever tried to war against it, it would defeat him every time. But if Jacob just simply stayed in the house and stayed at rest, stayed the resting man, stayed the resting believer, stayed rest, stay seated, Esau would come into the field one day and say, I'm going to die. Can you imagine the powerful man, the man that could do anything, the, the wayfaring man? Let me tell you something. I know men that are strong on the outside, trouble on the inside. Men that can do anything, that are physically powerful, troubled on the inside, never at rest, undone, there's no peace in their life. Listen, I'm going to tell you something. I remember John Hagee saying this testimony. He said, I remember I had a woman, and he said this, he said, I had a woman in my church, and her husband was a huge mountain of a man, probably like Justin, Justin Kepke. He said he was a huge man. A powerful man, a muscular man. He worked in oil fields in Texas. And he said that man had a disdain for God. He would, he would laugh at his wife for going to church. He would do his best to get her out of church. He would tell her it was useless. All that She was living a fairy tale. He said one day that powerful man was hurt on the oil field. And the, the wife called and said, would you please come to the emergency room? My husband's dying. He said, I came to the emergency room and I walked in and he said, I'll never forget it. He said, that six foot six, six foot seven man, powerful man, was laying on a, on a gurney, had a handful of sheet on both sides of him, and he died screaming, help me, preacher, help me, preacher. They're coming for me, preacher, help me, preacher. That's how he died. Because I'm going to tell you something, the sin nature... There's, a, there's an Esau that will overpower you every time. Ten times out of ten times. But as long as Jacob would stay in peace, God would bring Esau to his feet. Let me read to you 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. Because, well, let me read to you what Watchman Nee says. This comes out of his book, directly out of his book, The Normal Christian Life. Again, let, 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 I'm going to start right here. Again, peace is spoken of in both sections. He's talking about Romans 5 and 8. In, in the 5th and 8th chapters, Romans 5 tells us the peace with which God, in, which is the effect of justification by faith. That means the moment you get saved. Faith in His blood. Therefore, being justified by faith, we have peace with God through our Lord Jesus Christ. This means that now that I have forgiveness of, of sins, God will no longer be a cause of dread to me. I may know that there's a lot of people scared of God. I've had people that are dying. I, I mean this. I've had people that I, I know of that are dying and their families tried to witness to them and say, oh dear God, don't talk to me about God. That's the last thing I want to talk about is about God. That scares me. That's what the person said. I'm saying that's what they said. God will no longer be a cause of dread to me. I who was an enemy to God have been reconciled through the death of His Son. Romans 5 and 10. I very soon, however, find out that I'm going to be a, a great cause of trouble to myself. There is still unrest within me. 
For within me there is something that draws me to sin. There is peace with God, but there is no peace with myself. How many Christians is that true of? You know what undoes your heart? You know what undoes a man or a woman that's truly been born again? There's no peace as long as they're struggling with sin. Let, let me read to you 1 Thessalonians chapter 5. It says, Now may the God of peace, listen to it, Now may the God of peace himself sanctify you entirely, that your spirit and your soul and your body be preserved completely. Listen, you can have peace while you're being sanctified. You can have peace. You can rest in the finished work of Christ as God is conquering what is left in you. If you don't understand, if you don't grab a hold of this, if you don't understand it, you'll be in turmoil your whole Christian life. Because as long as you're battling, there's a lot of people in this house, and I know this is true. And this is true not only here, but all over the world. What causes the believer unrest is they know there's something unconquered in them. And every time they give into it, and every time they wrestle with it, and every time it comes back, there's, an un, there's, a, there's something that gets undone in them. And then they, they lose their peace. And how many know when you lose your peace, you do stupid stuff. You go crazy. Let me talk to you about Romans chapter 16 and verse 20. Listen to what it says here. It says that the God of peace will soon crush Satan under your feet. I'm going to tell you something. As you, you, know, you, know, you know what God needs to do to defeat what's in you? He needs to get you out of the way. Because we're so busy fighting and struggling. Listen, it was always meant to be a battle between the flesh, your flesh, and the spirit. Not your flesh and you. We misinterpret that verse and we think it's a battle between the spirit or the, or the flesh and me. No, it's, the, it's a battle between the flesh and the spirit. But the, but the Holy Spirit will, will wait until I finally relinquish the battle and get out of the way and then he'll start fighting. The scripture says this, that God is able to guard what you commit to him against that day. Yeah. What day? Every day. The day of your battle. The day of your struggle. These things that come upon us. Let me just get into, I want to, I want to extend this just a little bit about Esau. Esau is a wound battle. Esau is stronger than you. Esau is about unrest and restlessness. Esau is about overpowering the emotions. This powerful man comes in and he thinks he's going to die. He lives for a hundred more years. But there's an emotion, there's a voice in his life that is real, that is powerful, and is telling him, Esau, you're going to die. You're so exhausted, you're going to die. And listen, that voice, so convinced him he was going to die, he runs into Jacob and he says, give me something to eat or I'm going to die. It was real to him. It was a lie, but it was real. Let me tell you something. I don't care. I, I know I said this before. I've watched people. I thought of this with Catherine last night while she was giving her testimony. That, that in spite of everything, there were voices in her heart, in her head. She could not stop. They contradicted everything that was real about her. She's physically beautiful. Everything going for her. But whatever was driving her was so true, even though it was absolutely a lie, it was true to her. I mean, I'm just hear this. Let me get this into your spirit. There are lies that are so powerful and they cannot be stopped by you. They will hold you captive if you're not careful your whole life. And they are every bit the lie. And Esau comes in and he's got a, a mind full of lies and these things are real and they feel real. And, and, and Jacob says, well, I'll give you a bowl of my porridge. But I want your birthright. And he sells his birthright. And I think after the warfare was over, and after it ended, and after those voices quieted down, because how many know that you can go through a moment, man, where voices, something ignites them, and they are real? Come on. Come on, I know I'm not alone here. I might be the only one to admit it, but I know I'm not alone. And I'm sure after it was over, Esau must have thought, what did I do? How many have ever been told you're going to die? How many have ever told you're going to get sick? Your health is going to fail. How many have ever told you're going to go broke? There's some of you, these things eat at your spirit. 
And we don't say anything because I'm a Christian. I'm not supposed to feel that. I'm not supposed to hear that. I'm not supposed to be going through that. Let me just tell you something. It doesn't do any good to hide. I'm not, I'm not saying to rehearse them all the time. I'm not saying to talk about it all the time. But there are times that you need to talk to somebody that can pray for you. That can call those things what they are, lies. Brothers and sisters, and this is what Esau is. And he'll never be controlled and he'll never be conquered by Jacob. Let me get to what Jacob is. Jacob's a man of peace. He's a man, he's a picture of a man that's resting. And he, he, he has that moment where he says, I, I know I can't, I can't conquer Esau. Esau is stronger than me. I'm not even going to try. I'm not going to try. And as long as he's in that place, as long as he's giving Esau to the Lord, as long as he's saying, I can't contend with that. Do you know something? Your flesh is never going to get saved. Your flesh will be your flesh 20 years from now, just like it is now. Esau, Esau never, we don't see Esau, we see Esau going away, never dying. The flesh is there, there's always going to be the availability of the flesh in your life. But let me tell you what else Jacob was. Jacob was a man of the house. Be a man of the house. You got to be a man of the house. Listen, I'm going to just say some things. The Bible says that the house is where, a, in Acts chapter 2, a violent rushing wind came in where they were sitting. I'm going to tell you something. See, what I think about the violent wind is the Holy Spirit is violent about helping resting believers. When a believer rests in Christ, when a believer finally sits down and says, I'm tired of trying to deal with this in myself. I'm done with that. I've lost and I've lost and I've lost. And now I'm ready to sit down. I'm ready to rest in you. Let me just say something. There was no chairs in the Old Testament temple. There was no place to rest because the work of dealing with sin was never done. But the great joy of where we are today is that Jesus, if I give it to him, Jesus can conquer what is in me. Jesus can conquer your fear. Jesus can conquer your identity battles. Jesus can conquer your negativity. Come on. I'm sure negativity is a spirit. You're around people that, man, it can be sunny for three weeks in a row. Yeah, I'll wait until tomorrow. But it's they can find the one thing. God can, God, Jesus can conquer that faithlessness. Jesus can conquer that, that small vision you have for your life. I'm going to tell you something. There's a lot of mental crap. And that's what it is, is crap. That keeps people from really walking in freedom. From really walking in what God has called them to do and called them to be. Brothers and sisters, lies can become real, but I, I love this. The Bible says they were sitting there. Whenever you're ready to finally give it up, Jesus will take it. The Holy Spirit will be violent about dealing with your enemies. When you're sitting in the house, you're not trying to go after Jacob or Esau. You're not trying to contend with Esau. We're going to get into when Jacob finally did. It changed his life, and God, of course, brought it back around. It doesn't matter whether it's temper as long as Jacob rested in the house. Number two, we see in Acts or in Exodus 12, the Bible says when they rest in the house, they applied blood to the doorposts. The Bible says they were spared. Listen, when I finally give the battle, when my faith is in the blood, when my faith is in what Jesus has already done, Satan cannot have access to my heart. Let me just say something. Let me just say something. The Bible says peace comes by faith. So where your faith is, I, I, I bring my voices to the Lord and, and say, Lord, I can't conquer those. But you can. Uh, Catherine talked about hypochondria last night. And we can laugh about that, but it's a very real spirit. There's people that live their whole life fearful they're going to die. There, there's a fear that paralyzes their life. There's people that live their whole life bound, locked to shyness. Locked, it's a spirit. We, in our categories of sins, you would, never, you would never think shyness is a big deal, but shyness steals the call of God. Yeah. Yeah. It will steal the call of God. People that are so self-aware, they can't step out and do anything because they're so concerned. They're tormented by voices that remind them of every flaw and every 
bad thing about their character and they're scared to death to step out of it. Yeah. Brothers and sisters, that's not God. That's not what God has for your life. God has something so much more than that. I'm telling you something. God can conquer insecurity, all these jealousy, all these unseen things. I say this all the time. The problem with most people is they never just come right out and say, okay, here's the real issue. It's smoke and mirrors. They will, they will talk about everything but what's the real issue. What the real, you know why? Because the real issue is unconquerable to them and they're frustrated. And a lot of people, they're thinking, there's no point in me bringing out the real issue because I've tried to deal with it and I can't. You can't. Quit trying to and start believing that Jesus dealt with it at Calvary. Place your faith there. Let me just say something about the brass on a pole, the brass snake on a pole. What's so powerful about that is it was against the law to make a graven image. Do you know that? That was a contradiction of the law to make a graven image. But the Spirit of God comes down, they're all getting bit by snakes and they're dying, and then and God's plan given to Moses and Aaron, Moses walks out and said, Aaron, I got this plan, but it goes against the law. Well, what is it? Well, so I, I feel like God spoke to me. We're supposed to make a, a snake out of bronze and hold it up. And when the people look at it, they'll be healed. And Aaron must have said, but that's against the law. I know. Listen to me. I'm telling you something. The cross is more powerful than the law. The cross is more powerful. And then Jesus said, as the snake was lifted up in the wilderness, so must the Son of Man be lifted up. Now, this is the powerful thing. It says, whoever looked at that lived. That does not mean, listen, that does not mean they physically survived. It means that Holy Ghost power came into their life. Whatever mind issues they had that had tormented them, gone. Whatever health issues they had, gone. Whatever mental, emotional, gone. It means that it was like life started over again. <laughs> Looking at the cross. See, when you get your eyes off of you, mm -hmm. you get your eyes off of your struggle, and you start saying, Jesus, you dealt with this. I, by faith, believe that your death conquered this thing in my life. And you hold there. I'm not talking about, I'm not talking about you, you, you just confessing. I'm talking about you throwing your life on it. I'm not talking about words coming out of your mouth. I'm talking about you throwing your whole life on that truth. The way you're throwing your whole life on the chair you're sitting in. You know why there's rest in your body? Because everything you are right now is invested in the chair you're sitting in. That's why you have rest. The cross needs to be that. I have thrown everything I am on somewhere in the spring of 2014 on a trail holding onto the branch of a tree. I gave everything I have to the cross. I said either you did it and either it's conquered at Calvary or it's not. And I'm going to find out which one it is. Amen. And I'm going to tell you something. Jesus and his finished work, it will not fail you. Amen. Jacob was a man of the house. Number three, Mephibosheth. David calls Mephibosheth. Mephibosheth is a, we all know the story probably, Saul's grandson. He's a cripple. He's a throwaway. He used to be a king's kid. Now he's a beggar. Now he's a poor man hanging out with other poor people. He's a finished man hanging out with people that are finished. But Tyson, if, you're, if you feel like you're finished, get away from people that think they're finished. Because God's never finished with you. Amen. I don't care. I, listen, I don't care what has happened. God can resurrect anything. And David, this is such a powerful story. David starts asking some of his servants and says, Is there anybody left of the house of Saul that I can show kindness to? And one of them says, Yeah, he's got a grandson still alive. His name is Mephibosheth. He's a cripple. And David says, Go get him. And this man that was a poor beggar is picked up. And he's hauled to David's throne room in a chariot. And I'm sure the guy's quaking in his boots thinking, I don't know what's going what's to happen here. Maybe he's coming to finish me off because I'm the former king's grandson. You know, and he's brought before David and he's laid at David's feet. And David looks at him and says, Mephibosheth, I'm going to restore everything that was your father's. You're going to live with me the rest of your life. You're going to be in my house. You're going to eat at my table. 
And I'm going to make sure that all of your fields are taken care of. And, and we're going to send servants out in your field. And they're going, to, they're going to harvest your fields. And all the harvest is going to go to you. All as he sits in the house. And I'm going to tell you something. You know what? So sitting at a table, do you know that sitting at a table is the only place the Fibbishev could ever be? That his legs were hidden. Amen. And God will hide you. God will hide from you the wounds that have happened to you. They will be hidden where you can forget about them, where they don't control your life anymore, where you're not staring at them all the time, staring at what life did, staring at what somebody did, staring at what happened. So many people are caught up into that. I'm telling you, I don't fear the devil, but I do fear life. I've watched life steal people's motivation. I've watched it steal their dreams. I've watched it steal their passion. I've watched it steal their power. I've determined over and over and over again, that's not happening to me. I'm not ending it that way. I'm not going out that way. I want to believe. I want to be like the, the believers in the Hall of Faith, Hebrews 11, that says they died not having received what they were promised, but believing that they would. I want to go out. That's how I want to go out. I refuse. I refuse to live life defeated. I refuse to talk negative. I refuse to live that way anymore. I made a choice five years ago, and I'm not going back. And I don't care what happens. I don't care what you think, what happens in this house, what happens in this world. I'm not living that way anymore. I'll never live that way anymore. And you can ask my wife. There has been a change. Amen. You can ask my children. I'm not that man anymore. And I'm going to tell you something. When you, listen, if you will come to a place that you say, I can't conquer what's in me, but I'm tired of it. I'm tired of living down. I'm tired of living depressed. I'm tired of living negative. I'm tired of being consumed with what has happened. I'm ready to sit down and rest in you. I'm telling you, the power of the Holy Ghost will come to your help. I'm telling you, He will be your escape. He'll blow out of your life everything that has happened. Amen. It is true. It's our only hope. It is our only hope. I'm going to tell you something. Some of you are in a war in your life. You're in a war in here. You're in a war of whether or not you're going to grab a hold of the hope that's in Christ. Or you're going to just let life take control of you. And let, let life throw you wherever life is going to throw you. Do not do that. I don't care what you're going through. I'm telling you, nobody will not do that. It's not true. But I, I, for me, in my experience, I've watched God come to my rescue. Yeah. Not because I did anything right, but because I believed. Yeah. Just said, I can't do I, I know people, listen, there's, there's people, this, and, and you know it's true. Listen, this will never, as long as I have any say, this is never going to be a church where we'll come in with a fake smile and just do church. Yeah. Yeah. It's got to be real. Yeah. The truth is, there's some of you, you're broken, you're hurting, you're wrestling with something that has absolute dominion over your life and emotions. And that is not the way Jesus intended Christian life to be. Jesus said, I've come that you might have life, and that you might have more. But I love that the song Pastor Shane opened up with, to me, worship was, if it wasn't for anybody else today, worship was for me. I mean, it was for me. I can tell you what happened in my life two weeks ago. It was bizarre. It was right out of hell. I mean, it was purely right out of hell, something that happened to me two weeks ago. And, and, it, and I'm not going to lie that it altered me. It, it altered me for the last couple of weeks. And, but I came in here this morning, and I just thought, this thing is leaving today. I am done with this. I'm not being tormented by this anymore. Brothers and sisters, how many know that spiritual warfare is weird? Come on. I mean, Pastor Shane didn't get up one day. Eye problems all of the sudden. No explanation. Eye problems. Ulcers in his eyes. John falls off a ladder. You know, that, that, that's not, I, that doesn't just happen. I think those things are, I'm not, I'm not, I'm not trying to spiritualize everything, but I choose to say, I, see, I choose to live life this way. Satan, you took a good swing, baby. <laughs> See, I see John healing. I hear yeah. John healing. Yeah. Yeah. I know that God's not done with you, sir. Amen. In fact, he's not only done, he just gets started. Amen. Listen, I, so I'm telling you something, church. I believe this. I believe God. Satan has come to me and says, yeah, where's your promises now, loudmouth? Mm. 
still there. Where's your promise now about packing the house? Where's your promise now about all your teetotaling, talking about the cross? You have to make choices, and you have to make choices deep down in your gut. Nobody's there but you and God. You've got to make a choice to say, I'm not believing. I love that song. I'm not believing what I see, and I'm not believing what I feel. I'm believing what I've been told. And I'm to, I believe that Jesus and Calvary scattered every demon of heaven. I'm preaching at some point this sermon about Jacob's flock. And Jacob's flock is the damaged and the striped and the speckled and the ring. The Bible says ring scraped. I don't even know what that is. All I know is they were the weird sheep. And I say, Jesus, you gave Sidney and I the weird sheep. And I'll tell you something about weird sheep. Weird sheep need power. Weird sheep need power. Damaged people need power. They can't go to church where we just sing the three songs and go through the motions and pretend it's all okay. No, we need, this house needs heaven. This house needs the power of the Holy Ghost. This power needs tongue talking, spirit filled men and women of God. This church needs leadership that says that's where we're going and that's what we're believing in and I won't be moved. And, and, and you know, Jacob's got this crazy plan, and he's telling his wives years later, and they're saying, How did you end up with all daddy's stuff? He said, Well, let me tell you something. I had a dream. And in the dream, God showed me these, these sheep that were ring scraped and spotted and said, Go after those. And get them in, and, and, and take them to a gutter, a feeding trough, and put some white bark in front of them and get them to stare at that. And while they do that, they're going to get strong. Yeah. God, you know, you, listen, you know, what, you know what the tree symbolizes? The cross. Yeah. Stare at what Jesus did. Yeah. Come on! Yeah. Stare at what Jesus did. Yeah. Stare at the power of the cross when Jesus said, it is finished. Right. Come, stare at the resurrection that, uh, when the Bible says the tomb is now sealed. You know how the tomb was sealed? So that nobody could affect the resurrection but God. Amen. He said, Pastor, I feel like I've been put in a tomb good. Because now your resurrection is on God. On. Your resurrection is on God. Nobody can affect your circumstances but God. I love that. I love putting me in a tomb where only me and the Holy Ghost are. And I'll come out. I'll come out the day. Hallelujah. Thank you, Jesus. Mary, speaking of resurrection, the Bible says, Mary, this is so good. Lazarus, her brother, is dead. And the Bible says Jesus finally comes four days late. Been dead for four days. Why? I told you this the other day. Because the Jews believe, Pastor John is the first person I ever heard say this. Because the Jews believe that the Spirit lingered in the body for three days. So Jesus said, I'm going to wait till the fourth day. That way, nobody will be able to doubt it was me. But how many know that Jesus is always right on time? When all other hope is gone, when, when you think it cannot be done, Jesus say, now. Disciples are saying, Lord, hurry up. You go, oh, no, I got, I got a tiny. I got a tiny. How many have ever asked the Lord to hurry up? How many have ever argued with the timing of the Lord? Come on. I just wish sometimes he'd be a little early. <laughs> the Bible says when Jesus comes, Mary is sitting in the house. I love that. Sitting in the house. Sitting in the house. She's not moved. She's saying, I, I know Jesus. I'm going to sit in this house and I'm going to wait for the Lord to come to me. Mm. And some of you, let me tell you something, you sit in the house. You stay in that chair of rest. 
you stay there. I don't care what the devil says. I don't care what hell says. I don't care what your mind or emotion. You stay in that chair. Because Jesus is coming down the road. Jesus is coming down the road. Uh, for some of you, Jesus just hit tenacity. Come on. He's going to be here before you get out of church. Amen. Some of you, Jesus is on his way. Devil's told you he doesn't even know who you are. He gave up on you. Don't you believe that for a moment? Listen, Jesus said, I'll never be the one to leave. You'll have to leave. I will never leave you. I will never forsake you. I'm not slipping out the door. Yeah, I told Cash the other day, I said, Cash, we went out once with Timothy House. I said, you know what you I said, you know why you scare me? He goes, No. <laughs> and I said, because you're quiet. I said, because people like you just slip out the door. Jesus will never just slip out the door. Jesus ain't leaving. He's like a bad cold. Come on. Come on, praise God. I'm so grateful. You know, there's there's times that even in the church in the Word of God, they said, just leave. Just go away. Leave me to who I am. And the Lord said, Oh no. Oh no. I love you too much for that. You know, so we were we were doing um, our launch class this morning. And you know, have you ever like, okay, this is a really risky thing to say. But have you ever been nagged? Has anybody ever been nagged before? Come on, guys. Come on. Half of you, half of you are men of God, the other half of you are cowards. <laughs> but you know, the Holy Spirit's a nagger. The Bible says, when he told Peter, he said, Peter, lay down your net one more time. The Bible says in the, in the Greek, it's, and Jesus bade him. You know what that means? Jesus kept saying, do it. Do it. I've been working on that. Do it. Do it. Come on, some of you, some of you in your life, you have the Holy Spirit just nagging. Believe me. Don't run. Don't leave. Don't quit. Don't give up. He's nagging at you. Because that's what he does. Thank God he's a nagger. Come on. Thank God the Holy Spirit nags. I'm so tempted to say something right now. But the wisdom in me is saying, don't do that. Okay, let, let me talk about the feast of the Lord last thing. This is pretty powerful. Not the last thing. It's the last thing about Jacob. But, because i got six minutes and 26 seconds left. The Bible says that every year there were three feasts. This is so good. Every year there are three feasts. They were, most of them were at harvest time. And this is what the Lord says. The Lord says, I want every farmer, because Israel is a nation of farmers. He says, I want every farmer, the, the, the harvest is just coming up, it's just getting ripe, it's ready to be picked. I want you to leave it. Go to the feast. I want every soldier that's serving in the military, every one of you, resign your post, come to the feast. Can you imagine that? Come to the feast. I want you to come to the feast and I want you to sit. And, and for some of them, some of these feasts lasted three weeks. And you're going to rest for three weeks. And can you imagine those old farmers thinking, man, chewing on a piece of hay, and I got a harvest to get in. <laughs> some of these generals thinking, man, the enemy could attack us at any time. We're naked. The Lord said, oh no, I got it. Okay. I got your feast. Mm -hmm. I got your crop. I'm the protection of Israel. I'm, I'm the warrior of Israel. Come on, I, I'm, I'm the one. I'm the protection of this nation. You're not. You're puny. I'm it. I'm the general of generals, baby. I got it under control. I can keep your, I keep your enemies at bay being terrorized in their mind while you're worshiping me. Mm -hmm. Listen, I'm going to tell you something. You stay in the house. Stay, I don't care what's going on in your life. Stay in the house. Stay in the chair. Yeah. And some of this now applies to the house of God. Come on, if you think for a moment that Pastor Shane and Pam and Cindy and I and any other leader in this church, we're here all the time because we want to be. I mean, come on, you know, we just wake up. 
Don't touch that. That's not true. Is no. it not true? Not true. No. Or sometimes you drag yourself in here. Come on. Say, you know, I just, I know I should be here. I know I need to be here. Come on. This is where I need to be. And I think, some, I really do. I think sometimes when the Lord sees Cindy and I go out the door after all these years, seeing us go out the door, raising kids, family in struggle, battles going on, all hell breaking loose. I can say this about Pam and she, I can say it about John and Brent. I can say it about so many people. All hell is breaking loose and you just shut the door of your house and say, I'm going to church. Yeah. God's going to have to deal with that. Yeah. I can't do anything about I, I, I just got I just to shut the door. I look at the years of our life when it was embarrassing to come. Failure, problems. You can't hide in Orville. I mean, you know, it's always shocking. when It's always shocking to me when somebody goes, How did you know? It's like, come on. Orville is so small, you can dial the wrong number and have a conversation. Listen, man, and, and, and we would walk through some of those times. We knew we were to be talked about. We knew that, that, that things in our life looked like a contradiction. We're going to church. We're just going to go to church. We walk in, you know, troubled times. I, I know for a fact, I know for a fact, you know, the disciples had to think, you know, they probably hardly ever encountered storms on the Sea of Galilee before they met Jesus. It's like everywhere this guy goes, there's storms. Gosh, I never, I never, I never remember storms on, on, the, on the Sea of Galilee before this guy comes along. Come on, sometimes you get into these seasons where it's like, I think I had less problems before I got saved. Yeah. Has that ever crossed your mind? Yeah. But you know what, see, this is what I know. I know there's going to be warfare whether you serve God or whether you don't. But I would rather have warfare that takes me somewhere. Come on. I'd rather have storms because remember something, Elijah was taken to heaven in a storm. Come on. Storms take you places. Amen. When you're going through a storm, Satan will tell you you're just going through another storm. But I, 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 storms take you places. That's right. That's right. Elijah's taking out people standing, you know, people standing around, you know, watching your life. Oh, there they are, another storm. Oh yeah, here it goes again, another storm. Always in storms. Yeah, well, Elijah got the chariot. Yeah. Yeah. Elijah got the chariot. I, 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 listen, I, I'm convinced about the character of God. Mm -hmm. I'm convinced that God will not... God has, God's taken me someplace. God's taking... you got to get that in your spirit. Yeah. God is taking me someplace. I've been in multiple times. I've had voices in two weeks. I've had that I, I mean, I've literally, I've had to war. I've had to war in two weeks to get something from God, for the Word to speak to me, for the Word to make sense to me. But one thing I've been convinced of the entire time, deep down in my heart, is, God, you wouldn't do this. Amen. You would not let this end this way. This is not who you are. That's right, right. I'm convinced of that. I'm convinced of that. Now, let me get into the last part of this. So, here's what happens. Rebecca comes. I've got 19 seconds. To, I'm not, I can't do that. It's like, hey, <laughs> Rebecca comes in. She says, hey, Jacob. If you don't do something, Esau is going to get the birthright. Do you know what Rebecca's name means? Listen to this. Do you know what? Imagine being, uh, you know, first first date you ever have with her. Hey, baby. You go, you know, gazing in each other's eyes. What does Rebecca mean? What does your name mean? You know what her name means? To clog. Can you imagine her going, <laughs> that would take the wind out of that moment, you know? It's like, 
Did you say to claw it? <laughs> like as you clog a drain? <laughs> uh, you know what? I'm telling you something. I have a hard life and I have to find things to laugh at. So I laughed at that this morning and thought, my wife, the claw. <laughs> Makes me laugh. <laughs> anyway, do you know the essence of where it means to frustrate grace? Is to clog. <laughs> See, when Satan can draw you out yeah. and say, you need to fight Esau. You need to fight your flesh. You know what you're going to do? You're going to frustrate the grace of God. Yeah. And that's exactly what happened. And as a consequence of this, Jacob begins all these kinds of schemes. And he lives as a schemer for 20 years of his life. Because you can't outrun what's inside of you. What Jacob should have done is say, Mom, I don't know how God is going to change that thing. But I know I have a promise and you have a promise. And we don't need to be involved in this. God's going to do this. And I don't know what God would have done. I don't know what God, how God would have intervened. But somehow, God would have made sure that Esau did not inherit the birthright of the blessing. Somehow, God would have. We'll never know that because nobody rested. And Esau is, or Jacob's drawn out. And here's what happens. Fast forward 20 years. Jacob now is 400 times stronger. Right now he's dealing with one man. 20 years later when he comes back, he's dealing with Esau and 400 warriors. Listen, whatever you don't deal with today, you'll deal with down the line. Yeah, right. And it will only get stronger. I'm talking about it'll get a, a stronger hold on your emotions. It'll get a stronger hold on your faith. It'll get a stronger hold on your vision. It'll get a stronger hold on your hope. It will infect you. And so 20 years later, Jacob comes home. God says, now's the day you're going to deal with this. And Jacob, the Bible says, comes home. And this is sad. Here's, here's where Jacob, Jacob is self-absorbed. It is about survival, baby. He puts, can you imagine this? Can you imagine the husband going, hey, um, you know, my brother is really mad. And I've heard he's come with 400 men. And he's probably going to kill all of us. So here's what we're going to do. Honey, you're going to the wayfront. And so he's going to kill you and your kids first. Okay, baby? Thank you. And then he goes to the next wife. And then you're going to be... <laughs> this is like bizarre. You know, and then you're going to be next. And by the way, I'll run when I hear you screaming. That's what he does. He puts all four wives in front of him and all the four of the kids. And he's at the, he's at the back. Nice man of God. You know? I tell you something, you can get despicable when you get into self. You can get despicable. And that's despicable. And, and the Bible says, but here's what happens. He's got no peace. He can't rest. He's, he, he can't. I mean, there's turmoil in his soul. And he finally goes to, across the brook Jabbok. And the Bible says there he encounters God and him and God wrestle. And God touches the hollow of his thigh and he can't run anymore. And he limps back the next morning and says, okay, I'm done. There's only one way to deal with Esau, and it's to bow. Only one way to deal with this flesh. Only one way it's ever going to be conquered. And he steps out in front of everybody, in front of all his whole family, 75 people, and the Bible says the old man starts falling on his face. <coughs> Seven times he falls on his face. Every bow is saying, you're stronger than me. Every bow is saying, I can't deal with you in the natural. I've got to have God deal with you. God has to deal with you. You're stronger than I am. I'll never win. And the Bible says at that moment, God comes upon Esau and Esau says, whoa, 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 wait, wait, stand up. And he hugs him. Because when you're ready to bow, when you're ready to say, I can't do this, this lust, drug addiction, emotion, anger, unforgiveness, rebellion, hidden sin, secret living, always living in a false motive, always lying about what's really in your heart. I'll never win till I bow. Yeah. And in front of everybody, he starts bowing. And the Bible says this. The Bible says that Esau, they grab each other. Now listen, that's not the end of the story. But the end of the story is it's really powerful. Because the Bible says now they go back and they both start 
being blessed. But the Bible says one day, Genesis 36, Jacob doesn't even know this. Esau gets up one day and he says, he's the flesh, remember, type of the flesh. He gets up one day and he says, hey, everybody pack up your stuff. We're leaving. He says to his family, everybody, 400 warriors, whatever, except we're out here. We're leaving. See, I'm going to tell you something. God will not only conquer your flesh as it concerns you, but he'll conquer your flesh as it concerns everybody about you. It'll bless your family. It'll bless your ministry. God will not only conquer it for you as a person, God will conquer it over everything else God has for your life. God can banish the flesh off of your destiny, off of your children, off of your finances, off of your marriage, off of everything. The flesh will forever run away. It will forever be conquered so that you can live life the way you were supposed to. Amen. I look at people all the time and I think this. They drug around. My dad used to say this when he was, when he was still bound to alcohol and he couldn't get free before he got saved. This is what he used to say. He said, if I ever get this monkey off my back. There's people in this room, you've lived your whole life bound to something. You have never, Jessica going back, you have never, ever known as an adult a moment's peace. I was thinking about this when we were looking at Catherine's pictures last night and seeing pictures of her and Brittany. And when they were little girls, before the war came, right? Right, Remy? Before the battles start in here. You look at little kids running around this church, happy, laughing, before the war comes. And you look at a little kid like that with a beautiful smile, and her and Brittany are both beautiful women, and you never thought of what they were going to encounter when they had those pictures of them as little girls. And you can say that a thousand times. I say that. Uh, I know Carlos' story. I know so many people's story in this house. Robert, I know his story. Living life, happy 12, 13 year old. His dad has an aneurysm. And in a moment's time, his best friend, not just his dad, but his best friend, out of his life. Life completely starts with him. a different world. I'm telling you something, what makes a human being different from anything else, anything else in in the created world is that you and I have a spirit battle. There's a war in the spirit against your soul, against your spirit. Would you stand with me this morning? Listen, I, I thought that last Sunday, I thought this would be the atmosphere last Sunday. But I've been having something in my spirit say from God that I'm bringing, I'm, I'm bringing services that are going to be yoke-breaking. I just, I felt this in my spirit. I have felt God say to me, you're headed for a service that when you walk out, you're going to go, that's why. That's why we've been facing some of the things we've been facing. I believe that. So I want to do something this morning. Now, now listen. I don't want to just have leaders come up just because you want to come up or just because you're even bound to come up because some leaders, I think, actually need prayer too. But I want, I want this morning, if you're in this house and, 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 and there's just something in you that says, you know, I, I'm talking to leadership now, something in you that says, you know, I just feel like, like God has something to do or to say through me this morning. And I leave that between you and God. I want you to come. I want you to come and I want you to stand up here and be ready to let God speak through your life. So if you're a leader in that capacity, come on. It doesn't mean you're super spiritual. It just means that you sense this in your heart. Come on, leaders. Is there anybody? I don't have anybody. I don't have one leader that that's the place you're in. Oh, we're in trouble. Okay. I'm in that place. So... Is there anybody? Okay, so I'm just going to leave it there. If you're here this morning, you're here this morning and you would say, I need prayer. I got an Esau in my life. I got an Esau in my life. And I need to sit. I need to rest. I need to let God 
bring me and keep me in a place of sitting. Would you come? If that's you, would you come? You're in the house this morning and that's you. You have something in your life. Whether you're a believer, whether you're not a believer, if you're not a believer, we want to pray for you because we don't want you to leave without being a believer. But this is where you're at. morning. I don't care if it empties the pews or the chairs. If this is where you're at, I think there's some of you you need to come. Maybe you haven't responded, but you need to. There's something in your life. There's a, there's a battle of the flesh that make you worse. It makes you human. It makes you human. Come on. spirit. One thing I know, one thing I know, I know that you put this word in my heart. And I know that you love and you, there is nobody at this altar that is just another person. They're just another human being. There's nobody like that. Every person here is special, unique. You knew they were going to be here. You appointed this moment. They all need different things. But they all need the same thing. They need an encounter with heaven. They need an encounter with heaven. Because I want to say something this morning. Some of you, your spouses know your battle. And, and I think it affects you. It makes you makes you feel like, well, I'm not really saved or I'm not really true or I'm not really honest. That's not true. Cindy and I have fought with devils and demons and, and sometimes we, 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 you know, we don't look like we're fighting or whatever, but we're warring. There's been fights we regret. There's been things that were said that shouldn't have been said. But I've always known Cindy was sincere. And I believe she always knew I was. So if that's where you're at. Listen, your warfare does not mean you're not sincere. It means the devil knows you're sincere. The devil knows there's something real in your life or he'd leave you alone. If you were a hypocrite and a liar, you would be left alone. Your warfare is because it's real. Because there's something real in your life. There's something real. There's a destiny that's real. There's a heart that's real. There's a, a cry that's real. So raise your hands this morning. Come on, stretch your hands to the Lord. Stretch them out as, as far as you can get them. And I'm telling you something, Jesus is going to come. Father, in the name of Jesus, I ask you this morning right now, I ask you that you cause us to rest. Cause us to sit in the chair that is the finished work of Christ. Lord, I pray that people give up this morning. They give up trying. They give up trying in themselves. They give Esau to you. They bow to Esau and say, you're stronger than me, but you're not stronger than Jesus. I make it between, I make this battle between you and the Spirit. And not me and the and not me and the flesh. Listen, some of you, you fought with worry your whole life. Fear steals your joy. Fear steals away your happiness. You can't have a cup of coffee without fear. Some of you, you live in impatience. You're impatient. You live in, in, in the past. You can't break the hold of what's been done to you and what's been said to you. Jesus did it at Calvary. Jesus did it at Calvary. Jesus took that at Calvary. Listen, I want you to repeat something after me. Father, in Jesus' name, I believe, I believe that, at cross, that at Calvary's cross, you paid the debt. You, paid the debt. you died on my behalf, on my behalf. To, make to make me a dead man, to not feel not really and not be moved not really. by emotions that are from hell, voices that are from hell. I am dead to fear. I am dead to, to jealousy. I am dead to lust. I am dead to anger. I am dead to unforgiveness. In the name of Jesus, by faith in the finished work of Christ, I'm dead. I leave it here today. It is between, it is now between you and my flesh. In Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Listen, before you leave, before you leave. 
I want you to do something. I want you, if you're married, I want you to pray over your spouse before you leave here. I want you to pray. I think it's because you're fighting, you, you war against things that are not yours, but they're ours. And so I want you to do that before you leave. Love on somebody. Remember their small groups.